How did you end okay. up in India? I drifted a little bit. A ski resort with about three and a half thousand people. I moved to Mumbai with <laughs> around 20 million people. I decided that actually I really wanted to go abroad again. I You've been in education field for almost 20 plus years and you work globally in like England, Ghana, Switzerland, Dubai, Nigeria. So I studied neuroscience in Cardiff University in the okay. UK. A really fascinating combination of psychology, physiology, anatomy, understanding how our brains actually work. And what are some of the observations you made in the education system in India versus all the countries you visited or worked? The, the average performance of students here, as I say, it's, it's higher than it is typically around the world. How do you ensure that the teacher's height are aligned with your educational philosophy and your values? A teacher can have a PhD, they can be a professor yeah. and be wonderful at the subject knowledge, but if they don't have the ability to communicate it, to excite a child about learning about mm. that subject, there's no point in me putting them in a classroom. A student doing very well in academics, or they're not able to handle the, the complex situations or fear or confusions in their life. How much of a role of a you know the educator or a you know, school has to play in these aspects of the psychological structure of a student. The, the, the mindset around the, the psychology and yeah. the, the mental well-being of students, resilience. What is IB? What are the pros and cons? And I was working in a, a school in the rainforest in Ghana, but International Baccalaureate was really pulling me to get into this very different way of teaching with inquiry-based learning. Eye-opening experience of just what the International Baccalaureate curriculum can offer students. Oxford and Cambridge going off to wonderful universities in the US and around Europe. What should be the, the relationship between a teacher and a student? So for me, it's about teachers that are willing to, to go that little bit further for their students. The holistic education, the same children, they have gone through some kind of education, are participating in wars. You know, not all, but some of them are becoming like neurotic. Do we need to take a step back and think ourselves in first place, why are we educating our children? What is the ultimate purpose? And what is the, the right meaning of education? Okay, there's, there's a lot of elements to what you've just <laughs> talked about there. Games out there which provides a cheap dopamine effect. When you feed a child's hunger for anything, yeah. they become even more enthusiastic about it. Since we talked about artificial intelligence like you know, chat GPT, things like plagiarism. Within weeks of the, the launch of AI, a little over 12 months ago, and that's all it was, was 12 months ago when ChatGPT came alive. In 2019, the homeschoolers were around 2.3 million in US. And by 2022, it's 4.3 million students who have been homeschooled. You know how the general history is. The history is about, you know, the kings, the queens, the presidents, the wars and the dates and the rest of it. What's about the, the fact about the history of actual man? You know what I mean? It wasn't just you know, going off to do engineering or law, it, making sure that they understand what their responsibility is to the world. Yeah. It Thanks for coming out. Welcome to AMA. Really appreciate taking your time and coming out here. Thank you so much for inviting me. Quite excited awesome. to be here. My yeah. first ever podcast. So how are you doing? How is the progress of your school coming along? And are you set for this academic year? It is coming along great. The, um, the building work is on track for us to be inviting our CBSE students in a little over two weeks, 9th of April, okay. CBSE program starts. And we're running an IB bridge program as well for the short period of time that the CBSE schools would be open during April to help those students, particularly the older students, transitioning from different curriculum, CBSE, State Board, into the IB curriculum. So the, the main flagship building, mm -hmm. which is quite an exciting thing for me because it's the IB building, um, that is well on track. Um, and then we've got the sports complex, which will be largely finished by April as well. Um, so yeah, some really good progress. And uh, I think if you, I can't remember, when was the last time you were down there? It was a couple of months back. You'll see some pretty big changes when you- I'll visit then in a week or so. Good, 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 good. The amount of work went in, in a short period of time. And obviously the vision, the plan, the implementation from you and Kundal ADR and your team, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like, you know, the infrastructure wise, what I've seen in the VR and the construction going on.
talk a little bit about your journey based on my research you started your career as a, a science teacher in UK and Absolutely, uh, yeah. you've been in education field for almost 20 plus years in several leadership roles IB principal and you work globally in like England Ghana Switzerland Dubai Nigeria and of course in India for the last 7 years and you played multiple roles in your journey how did you end okay. up in india well first of all i think i mean my career path like many people now it hasn't gone in the direction that it started off the original plan when i was at school was to study medicine and like many people didn't yeah. quite get the grades to go first time to to study medicine in the uk so I thought i'd go and do a biomedical science degree at undergraduate doing uh, postgraduate studies and, and become a doctor that way. So I studied neuroscience in Cardiff University in the okay. UK um, and found it a really fascinating combination of psychology, physiology, anatomy, and, and understanding how our brains actually work. And a large part of that is how we learn. After that, I drifted a little bit and <laughs> ended up becoming an, a, a volunteer teacher in Ghana. So as an untrained unqualified teacher I was working in a, a school in the rainforest in Ghana the the direction that that sort of took me in after that was to come back to the UK where I decided that actually I really enjoyed teaching mm. and this was absolutely against the 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 suggestions and the guidance of both my parents who were both in education but I came back from Ghana inspired to become a teacher so I worked in a, a very deprived area of Liverpool to start with and then I went and worked at my alma mater my old high school and spent a, a year working sat mm. at the same desk as my former biology teacher during that I decided that actually I really wanted to go abroad again I, I enjoyed my time in Ghana so I started looking for international teaching opportunities so moved to Nigeria the, and then decided that I really wanted wanted to get into international baccalaureate Cambridge curriculum yeah. in Thomas Adewumi in Nigeria but international baccalaureate was really pulling me to get into this very different way of teaching with inquiry based learning so i moved to the Czech Republic Prague one of the top school in Europe this year for ib results is the english college in prague yeah. where i spent 2 years learning how to be a really good IB biology teacher for the diploma students but that was my real eye opening experience of just what the international baccalaureate curriculum can offer students yeah in terms of the holistic development and the students from ECP in Prague were literally going on to amazing things at Oxford and Cambridge going off to wonderful universities in the US and around Europe doing a whole variety of things it wasn't just going off to do engineering or law it was students going off to do set design for televisions and theater it was students going off to do sound engineering fashion design mm -hmm as well as students going to do medicine and going to do the more traditional yeah. conventional routes so that was a pretty pretty interesting couple of years in from there to moved to Switzerland to one of the top most exclusive boarding schools at uh, college alpine bosole in Villar in Switzerland um where they were looking for a head of department so it was a combination of my leadership experience in Ghana my teaching in the UK teaching science um and then coming into Bosole as a the head of science there working with future politicians future leaders in business future government leaders you know that that making sure that they understand what their responsibility is to the world you know it was a, it was a very big part of my role there and uh, creating opportunities for them to get involved in projects where they could make a real difference and that's something that you know for 6 years i i organized trips service trips to africa to india moving from there i decided that it was time to move from a, a very small village and from a a ski resort with about 3 and a half thousand people i moved to mumbai with <laughs> around 20 million people. So I spent 6 years then working at at the Oberoi International School on their OGC campus, initially as high school principal and then taking over running the whole of their secondary school with some amazing colleagues and that was my, you know, working introduction to to living in India. After 6 years there, I moved as a head of whole school in the uh, Ambassador International Academy in Dubai from where I moved to Hyderabad based at Manchester Global School and very excited to be opening our doors this year to some very exciting opportunities for people here in Hyderabad around India and from other parts of the world as well that's uh, quite a journey <laughs> there's a few air miles in there yeah. that's for sure how is the experience in india it's been amazing um oberoi international school it was in a city that i'd been to um i'd visited mumbai three times i think before taking the opportunity there um i do love my cricket um which i'm sure we'll touch on sure. later um and i do love indian food the opportunity to come and live in in the maximum city was something that was you know it was it was something that i couldn't turn down so manchester global mm -hmm. 
uh, you have an IB and CBSC. Uh, yes. I read your statement, you and Kondaledi got a statement about what is the Manchester Global uh, Schools. At Manchester Global School, our vision is to grow pioneers, leaders, and entrepreneurs. We will achieve that based on three key dimensions. The first is world-class education with great teachers. The second is holistic development of your child, where they will learn problem solving, prepare for life, and many other things. The third, equally important, is growing with core Indian values. And this is what our mission and vision is about. The facilities that we're putting together for boarding and for education, as well as for our incredibly strong extracurricular program, is comparable with those kind of schools, the most expensive, exclusive and high quality premium schools globally and not just here within India. Now, if I want to deep dive in those two points, um, the first one is uh, the world-class education with great teachers. And this is pretty good, like what you explain on IB, the learning methods. How do you find the you know right teachers for these kind of educational boards? What is the criteria you consider for recruiting the exceptional teachers to make this happen? And in, in principle, how do you ensure that the teachers hide are aligned with your educational philosophy and your values? This is one of the things that I'm really enjoying about leadership. And one thing that surprises some parents when, when they ask that question, how, how do you get these teachers that can teach IB really well? Yeah. Well, the IB is a growing curriculum. And therefore, teachers at the moment have a lot of choice. There's a lot of new IB schools opened here in India. There's a lot of IB schools open in the Middle East and in China that are recruiting good IB teachers. And for me, to, to have the opportunity to identify teachers that can be amazing IB teachers is a wonderful challenge. And I'm not going out looking for every one of my teachers to join us with already 10 years of teaching experience in the IB because I'm not gonna find them. And if I do, it's gonna cost a fortune and the fees will go up and it'll just be a, a very difficult thing to maintain. What I'm looking for is exactly what you said at the end of your, 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 yeah. your comment there. I'm looking for the right mindset to buy into the vision. I'm looking for exciting teachers who will inspire students. A teacher can come from any, background. any curriculum background. If they are given the right training, the right opportunity to learn about how to be an inquiry teacher, how to lead learning in an inquiry-based classroom, then I can work with them to help them become a wonderful IB teacher. And, you know, I've done hundreds, literally hundreds of interviews to recruit the teachers that will work in the IB section over the next few years in setting up Manchester Global School. I'm looking for people that have got energy, that have got an element of excitement, that have got a, a little glint in their eye because there's something about what they do that they really, really love. And for many of those teachers, the, the connections and the relationships they build with the students will be more valuable than their subject knowledge. The teachers will have great subject knowledge and they'll have their masters and their B.Eds and all of the right qualifications that we need them to have, probably more than they need to have. But what matters more to me is that they've got the ability to inspire a student. A teacher can have a PhD, they can be a professor yeah. and be wonderful at their subject knowledge, but if they don't have the ability to communicate it, to excite a child about learning about mm. that subject, there's no point in me putting them in a classroom. That's uh, exactly my next question. Like, what should be the, the relationship between a teacher and a student? Okay, I mean, I look back at my own school days and I am still in touch with several of the teachers that I built good relationships with, whether it was teachers that taught me in the classroom and I really enjoyed their way of, of communicating with me or teachers that I had as sports coaches mm -hmm. or ran the extracurricular activities that I was involved in. I've, I've come into education largely because of those experiences at school. I was very lucky to have that. I look back on those relationships where I did feel comfortable going to a teacher and saying, hey, look, I don't understand this. Can I sit down for 10 minutes with you and, and can you help me understand? I want students to feel like that about their teacher. I want them to respectfully go to a teacher and say, look, I'm struggling. Please help me. I really enjoyed this. I, I know this much. I want to go a little bit further. Where can I go? What can I do 
to go beyond what you've taught me in the classroom. Mm -hmm. And that's that's a, a respectful, warm relationship that is professional at all times, but it's an openness about the teacher makes sure that the majority of students will feel comfortable coming to them. Now, people that we come across, we always have different kinds of relationship and one teacher might have a very strong relationship with 80% of a class, but 20% might not connect with them as much. Yeah. I look for people that will have as open a personality as possible, but I will always talk to students about, you know, just because one maths teacher, you don't get it from that maths teacher, yeah. a school will have more than one maths teacher. Yeah. Feel free to go and talk to the other maths teachers. They will always, if they're good teachers, they'll always help other students in the school, whether they're in the same class or not. And during your time in a school, you'll have different teachers when you're in different classes, different grade levels. Yeah. So as you go through the school, you'll have different teachers at different times and you can build those different relationships. And for some students, it may be that the maths teacher is the basketball coach. Great, okay. For others, it might be that the basketball coach is a French teacher and they never actually get taught by them, yeah. but they go and practice their French because they, they get on well with that coach. So for me, it's about teachers that are willing to go that little bit further for their students, whether it's a little bit further in supporting them with catch-up sessions, mm. whether it's filling in gaps, or whether it's doing other things helping yeah. out in boarding, helping out with sports coaching, helping out with creative activities. All of that, organizing trips. Trips are a huge part of education, but the teachers that give up their time and energy to do that will be the ones that have the best relationships with the right. students. That's what makes the difference in learning. Now, the second point, the holistic education mm -hmm. and prepare for the life. So I gave some thought, do we need to take a step back and think ourselves in first place, why are we educating our children? What is the ultimate purpose? And what is the, the right meaning of education? What I mean by that is uh, I have no doubt on the academic side, you know, with the, with the kind of infrastructure, the teachers, they're going to do very well, which is perfectly fine. And they probably can turn into a professor or engineer. All the academics are in majority of school is pretty, doing a pretty good job. When we look at the, the holistic, the child development, prepare for the life, what about the, since you are also studied neuroscience, right? Mm -hmm. How about the you know the psychological structure of a student? Because if you see around us, a student doing very well in academics or subjects, but they're not able to handle the, the complex situations or fear or confusions in their life. That's one. And second one is the same children gone through great education from good schools are participating in wars and in you know violent acts. You know, mm -hmm. you're seeing whether it could be Israel or Russia, or like many other countries, right? They have gone through some kind of education and a lot of very very well educated engineers, doctors and specialists are, you know, not all but some of them are becoming like neurotic. If you see it's in our day to day life, most of the people from past few decades versus now, they're becoming more, you know, self centered. How much of a role of a, you know, the educator or a you know, school has to play in these aspects of the psychological structure of a student. Okay, there's, there's a lot of elements to what you've <laughs> just talked about there. Let me take first of all the the the, the, the mindset around the, the psychology and yeah. the, the mental well-being of students. Um, I think that one of the things that I've spent a lot of time learning about, particularly in the last seven or eight years, um, is a word called resilience. Mm. It's helping students to build the ability to cope with what's going on around them. And in a curriculum that is purely focused on assessment and exams, and academic yeah. level, then that can be really overlooked. And we build resilience by putting people in environments that test the ability to respond to the things that are going on around them. And that's fine in a classroom where it's all controlled academics. That's something that we can expect people to, to learn about. But, you know, taking students, we talked about trips, um, during our little break, the, the taking students out of their comfort zone, taking students who are growing up in a city environment where they've got a phone in their hand all the time and teaching them how to live for a week without the phone in their hand, without electricity, without hot running water, having to cook for themselves, dig toilets for themselves, you know, survive, enabling them to experience those things in a safe way. In, an, in a way that is supportive and, and helping them to develop those skills is giving them skills for life. Mm. It's building resilience in a very practical way. You want your children, when they get to 17, 18, 19 years old, to be able to go away from home and survive on their own. Otherwise, you as a parent haven't done your job. Yeah, yeah. So by providing programs like the Duke of Edinburgh Award, where we have to take them, the International Award for Young People here in India, where they have to do an outdoor expedition, 
They have to survive on their own for four or five days. Those kind of trainings and opportunities are giving them skills for life. And that balance of understanding resilience in an academic setting so that they are prepared for the competition of getting to universities and, and interviewing for jobs alongside the life skills, mm. that helps to build that psychological profile where they are tough enough to exist in the world but also empathetic enough to understand that it's not just about them and their family. Yeah. Because if we all take that approach, then the whole society just crumbles. Yes. It's about making sure they understand their place in the world. And the IB is all about that. From the PYP where, where the units involve things like who we are and, and what, what is the world around us, mm. through the MYP where they're looking at individuals and societies as a subject. How do they as an individual fit into society? through the geography of where they are, through the history, through economics. It's about making sure that we as a school are prioritizing that ability to, to test resilience. And you do that by creating a safe environment and putting the support structures in place for when things do go wrong. Yeah. So one of the first appointments that I was allowed to make, and one of the signs to me that Manchester Global is an exciting school, one of my first appointments was my psychological counselor. Mm -hmm. My social emotional counsellor, um, Dr. Megna, I'm very excited. A young, exciting, um, qualified psychological counsellor who actually trained as a dentist. You know, she's changed her career path because she understands that actually this is where we need to focus. As, as educators, we need to make sure that, that pastoral care, that psychological care and the right support and the right advice is given at the right time. And we've already started writing our programs for that. You know, before we've started focusing on the academic curriculum, we're creating the, the processes, the guidelines, the environment for a safe psychological space for children. That, that to me is a really, really positive sign that all the other things can come together. Holistic learning beyond the classroom and within the classroom is, is massive in the IB. You know, we're not teaching um, maths in isolation as maths. Mm -hmm. The transdisciplinary learning and using maths outdoors, using maths in ways that are helping students to build their own sort of, you know, their financial literacy, helping them to build those skills helps with all the other things. And I think that that's what education in some curriculum in India and in other countries, even in the UK, yeah. has neglected for too long. The, the focus of just building academically successful graduates is pointless because they don't have the skills Absolutely. necessarily to manage. And then it, traditionally it's come down to what they've learned at home. Those students that are successful in life, maybe at home they've been on camping trips, maybe it's that they've you know, been given the instruction on how to cook, how to look after themselves in the home that yeah. gives them the ability to survive. But a lot of students I've come across who've gone off to university who've not had an IB education, you know, they've struggled with those things. Yeah. They don't know how to cook. They, they don't know how to book their own flight tickets. Yeah. But at Manchester Global School, we'll use a lot of the activities that I've done in previous schools, having students plan and organize their own trip, sitting down with the school accountant, booking their own transport for a school trip, booking their own flights, their own buses, learning how to make those arrangements are life skills. Yeah. And, and those life skills are what will make them independently successful as well as academically successful. Amazing. Yeah, I, I really like that word, uh, resilience. Phasing that in. So as they come through primary, they do overnight. So they start with overnight trips when they're eight years old, nine years old, and then building it up to, to trips where they are doing those kind of camping activities yeah. to eventually doing overnight wild camps when they're 16 yeah. years old. That's real adventure. Exactly. That's what we missed in my days, at least. We used to have a lot of curiosity on, you know, nature or whether it could be stars, moon, all the celestial bodies, universe. These kind of uh, activities would definitely help the, the kids to connect to the nature. Well, one you might right? get excited about. Yeah. Um, at Oberoi, I introduced a trip for the grade 10s. Mm. Um, it was a five-day trip where it was uh, white water rafting down the Ganges. And the, the valley of the Ganges is so steep that for far, four of those days, we didn't actually reach road level. Mm. So there was no contact with the outside world. It was the students, the teachers, the guides on the boats. Um, and we carried all the food, the tents, the students did the cooking. They had to dig toilets on the beach, put up their own canopies to sleep <laughs> under. Um, and these are students that had never done anything like it. 
I mean, the, the most that they'd done, some of them yeah. had done a camping trip with the school the year before, but that was their first time sleeping in tents. So on their second trip, they're having to put up the tents themselves, prepare the food by the side of the river, um, use toilets that they've prepared themselves. And all of that gave them a very different perspective on life. And for some of them, it's a real test of their resilience. Yeah. When I was a child, I used to wonder about stars, universe. At some point, it all fades away and focus into the academic part. But if I see the Western countries, the camping, of course, it's picking up in India recent days, but this camping culture, living outside for a while, that's been there from a long time. And also, if you look at the, the movies like Star Wars, which we don't have in, in, the, in the East, like countries like India, when I talk eight-year-old in India versus eight-year-old, role in some other Western countries. They do have a lot of understanding about the universe here. I don't see that that much of a, the understanding of it. Is it because of the, the the same reasons you mentioned, science education or not being outside in a camp, the effect of movies? What do you think? I think it's a bit of, bit of everything. I mean, mm. the, the, the environment that a student grows up in is a combination of home life. You know, yeah. if, if a student is not in a boarding school, by the time they reach 18 years old, they've spent 85% of their time with their family. 15% yeah. of the time, only 15% of the time is actually spent in school. Yeah. So it all depends on what kind of stimulus they've had around. Now, a school can be a big part of that. If the school is taking a lead in providing great opportunities, then it can really inspire a student. And, you know, at Manchester Global, we'll be, you know, focusing on the stars and the planets with our planetarium and the, the ability to go up on our roof because of the, the lack of pollution where we are. To be able to go up and, and look at the stars at night, I've already got in my mind that the, mm. the students who are boarding in the first few weeks we're going to do an outside camping on the roof at school wow. because we've got space up there that's being carefully designed to give us opportunities to do crazy things things that are going to light a spark in a child that you know they'll lie under the stars at night and go i want to be up there they'll see and yeah. learn about that in the the planetarium and we'll provide every opportunity to to go down that route of staying engaged with a really exciting opportunity for their future I, th I think that in terms of why it's different in India compared to other parts of the world, I think that looking at the the culture, looking at the the the, the way that children are exposed to movies, to books, it is different. And the, the majority of schools, you know, may not have been able to provide the opportunities because of the, the economy. I mean, yeah. when we look at the ability to go into a school library like we will have where students can pick up a book and capture their imagination, historically, India hasn't had that many schools that students can go and do that. That. And it's it's been a privilege to be able to get that kind of education, but it is becoming more widely available. And it's something that through our resources, we hope to offer the opportunity to introduce other less privileged community members in the area, mm -hmm. those kind of opportunities where we can try and inspire through service um, the, the, the kind of learning engagements that we want for our own students. And that's a big part, again, of the, the philosophy of, of Dr. Condal and the board, that they want to make a wider impact, not just for the students that are at Manchester Global, but for the wider community as well. Probably provide more Einsteins and Newtons. <laughs> yeah. one or two. Since you work globally in several countries, so what are the some of the observations you made in the education system in India versus all the countries you visited or worked in the areas of culture, curriculum, grading system, and parental involvement? There is so much diversity within India within education. Yeah. And I think that from my perspective coming in as part of an international baccalaureate school, it's given me the opportunity to look at what goes on around the international curriculum. I think the one thing that really does stand out to me is that education here in India is seen as, it is seen as a privilege and people really do value it. And the vast majority of students, yeah. they enjoy learning. They want to learn, they want to do well, they want to make their families proud. And that introduces different elements that are probably not as prevalent, as not as strong in other countries that I've worked. The sense of competition, um, in some schools is very, very strong. Yeah. And that comes down to systems of grading, curriculums that are assessed largely based on exams. Yeah. And that can be very good for students. It can be something that a lot of students really enjoy and thrive with. Actually, you know, not every child can be top of the class. It's That's the nature of a list. It's the nature of having a competitive approach. And psychologically, those students that are not reaching the pinnacle, not reaching the top, not in the, the top 10%, it can be really challenging to be in a system where education values the top. Yeah. And for that reason, I like the International Baccalaureate. I like the fact that it's not seen uh, in the same competitive 
competitive way by most schools. There are some schools that do their rankings of their students still for IB, but the majority of schools look at that and go, okay, it's about personal progress. It's about doing the best that a child can do yeah. compared to where they start the year. So long as they show good progress through the year and become the best that they can be, then that's good. That, that That's what we're looking for. Um, when I think about the, um, the students that I've been lucky enough to work with, many of them have, you know, they've been above average. Here in India, the, the average IB scores in India tend to be higher than around the world because the students do value that education. They do mm. work hard. And that does give them an advantage because I think that when they apply to universities, be it here in India or be it around the world, there is definitely a competitive element to that process. I mean, mm. a lot of students apply for places where they are oversubscribed and therefore the universities have to select the best fit for those universities. But best fit for many universities outside of India is not always mm. the top school. Yeah. And trying to educate parents about that, trying to make sure that students understand that, you know, if you're doing the best that you can be, we can help you find the right university for you mm. or the right group of universities to apply to. And then hopefully you will have a choice at the end of that as to what is the best fit for you. Um, but of course, grades do matter. Grades are important. And when when I look at, at the, the average performance of students here, as I say, it's, it's higher than it is typically around the world. Grading system, like you mentioned, some of this uh, curriculum like IB doesn't fall into that traditional way of grading that probably are addressing some of the, the psychological effects of a students to and the competition or whether you know everyone should be getting a higher grade that aspect of course these boards are addressing some of the problems but irrespective of the board is for example let's take academics history right you know how the general history is in many many of these boards at least uh, when i am studying the history is about you know the kings the queens the presidents the wars and the dates and the rest of it what's about the the fact about the history of actual man who is evolved over thousands of you know years and what i, I feel is like if child or a student know that extraordinary story or a history of a man and if they can relate to it it, they would you know like show probably the better interest in you know what i mean yeah absolutely and i think that one of the joys about the ib approach to history yeah and to other subjects is that when you compare the assessment so for your history exam i presume you had to remember a lot of dates yes had to remember a lot of names a lot of locations and what happened where and when in the ib a lot of the assessment for history is actually based on a student deciding which period of history they want to look at then they will look at sources you know primary and secondary sources where they're looking at interviews, they're looking at video recordings, they're looking at books, they're looking at photographs, at archaeological um, archaeological artifacts, and they're using the data and the information to compare one occurrence in history to another occurrence in history yeah. to find out what we've learned. And that's okay. done through coursework rather than exams. There are exams in history, mm. but more of it is done where they can actually use the internet to do research, they can cite their references and use their skills to compare and contrast what's gone on during history. And that's a very different approach. Yeah. And giving them the ability to choose the periods of history that they're most interested in, um, again, it means that they are more likely to develop those skills because they're looking at things that they're passionate about. And there's lots of different elements in the IB where students have choice mm. about what they can study, how they can go about studying it, which I think makes the learning experience more enjoyable. So a, a, a student identifying an area that they have a, a real interest in, a passion for it, they can then use that for their learning. And there's lots of different opportunities, whether it's the IB diploma, whether it's in the middle years program with the personal project, um, whether it's a, a a, a, a summative assessment in one of their units in PE or whether it's in science or in languages, there's always going to be things that they can choose yeah. that will really feed their hunger for learning. And when you feed a child's hunger for anything, yeah. they become even more enthusiastic about it. They become more passionate about it and therefore the learning is more powerful. Right. I've heard some arguments as well. The argument goes like this. Do we really need to have child go through that intense of history or geography because the current technologies we have or AI and all these of course you know subjects like arithmetic or the language and those things are key to understand and read and child picks up whatever they are interested in and these kind of area history and geography can be picked up whenever he or she interested from these great technology available today how much of importance that plays in a role you it, know? It, it's massive I mean what we've got to remember is that we are producing young adults with a very different world than the one that we 
came into. As, as, as we left school, you know, the internet was just becoming alive. Right. I, I only had my first email address when I joined university. Hmm. Um, I didn't have a mobile phone until probably my second or third year at university. Yeah. And yet now, the mobile phone that a student holds in their hand is 150, 200, a million times probably more powerful yeah. than a laptop that I used when I was at university. Yeah. The internet gives us information, facts, figures at the touch of a button. And therefore, the skills that students students need to be successful, to be dynamic, to be efficient in the future workplace, whether it's in business, whether it's in medicine, whether it's in law, all of those things are are very, very different to what they were 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Yeah. Um, and they're completely different to what they were 50 years ago. If the education systems, if the systems of assessment don't reflect those changes, hmm. then all we're doing is producing young adults who yeah. are not fit for the kind of jobs that we need them to go into mm. to keep driving the world forward. Now, when I talk about driving the world forward, I talk, I, I think about development in terms of improving human lives. I think about, yes, there's huge advantages in technology. There's the economics of finance where, where yes, the, the capitalist culture that we are well, well embraced into now yeah. is a big part of what universities and future employers look at is how, how we can produce people that are useful to drive the economy. But if anyone is going to do anything of significance significance in the world, they have to embrace technology. And just to think about the IB, the International Baccalaureate, within weeks of the, the launch of AI, a little over 12 months ago, and that's all it was, was 12 months ago when ChatGPT came alive. Mm. Within weeks, the IB had a statement supporting the introduction of technology, embracing how we can use it as IB educators, and acknowledging the fact that that is the future of learning. Not saying that we, students shouldn't use it, not saying that it's going to you know, defeat the purpose of exams and essay assessments, but actually saying, how can we educate our students to use this ethically and usefully as they move forward? Since we talked about artificial intelligence, like, you know, chat GPT, how do we raise the kids in this kind of technological culture? We have iPads or unlimited YouTube videos or TikTok for teenagers and a lot of games out there, which provides a cheap dopamine effect, mm -hmm. plagiarism. How do we balance perfectly for industrial schools, especially? You know, there's, there's many angles we can look at it from. There's, there's a mindset that looks at technology and goes, okay, let's give all the students all the old skills, the handwriting, the yeah. looking books up in the library, the using an index in the back of a book. Mm. And that's important because we have to have a fallback because there will be times with power cuts, there'll be times when people are traveling and they are out of connection with, with uh, mobile phone networks and so on, where they have to know what to do. You still need to know how to read a map. Yeah. You still need to know how to um, look something up in a book because there will be times when you need to do that. So it's a case of balancing that with making sure that they know how to use technology to their benefit. Then it comes to the ethics of it. Yeah. It comes down to how do we make sure that a student knows that when they're writing an essay, yes, using chat GPT to help them put their facts together together into a, a successful sequence works, but they have to know what a good essay looks like before they can do that. Yeah. Because you could put something into Google or into ChatGPT and say, write me an essay. Yeah. And you can trust that it's a great essay and hand it over to your teacher. But if the teacher then sits down with you and says, how do you write a good essay and you can't do it? then have you used it ethically? You've cut a corner. What, what we've introduced in IB schools is to make sure that we work with the students using things like Google. The technology of the history of a document on Google will help us to see how a student progresses their work. So a teacher will look at the start of the work, they'll look at the outline bullet points that a student records at the start of their work, and then they'll see how it grows from those bullet points into short paragraphs, into longer paragraphs, and they'll suddenly see if it suddenly changes that two paragraphs Paragraphs have disappeared and something very different and high quality appears in its place yeah. that's been copied and pasted in from ChatGPT. Yeah. Then the question is, why these changes? And we've got the technology to be able to, to track that if we need to. The preference is that a student actually uses the technology well and where they've used it, they put in brackets that this section of text has been produced by ChatGPT. I put in this particular instruction and this is what came out. And that's fine, that, that's, that's acceptable use. Now, obviously, when you're working with little ones, they're not as technologically advanced, they're not as well educated, but it's about finding the right steps along the journey to make sure that they understand what we expect of them, 
in yeah. terms of referencing, in terms of citing any any other work that they've included in their own writing. And in, in all honesty, when you actually sit down with a student yeah. and talk about their work, it does become evident quite quickly when a child has cut corners yeah. because they're not able to explain the rationale behind what they've written. Mm. It's very simple. I take your essay away and I say, right, I want you to now rewrite the first section of your essay in bullet points yeah. <laughs> and explain to me. And they've got no recollection because all they did, if they cheated, paste. is copied and pasted across and they've not actually done any learning. Yeah. So learning and use of technology are are complementary, but you can use technology without learning. Yeah. But you can be found out if you do that. This is a common problem for all the universities and boards like IB. Uh, is there any the softwares or technology which can figure in these plagiarism? Do you think these boards are working towards to fight that kind of scenario? Oh, absolutely. absolutely there are. And the, there are tools such as Turnitin, mm. which is developing alongside technology. And Turnitin had been incredibly useful until ChatGPT came along in terms of it would analyze is a text produced by a student, it would find any sections of test text that are common to anything else that's on the database of Turnitin. So if you wrote an essay mm -hmm. and submitted it and it was your teacher, our teacher, put it through Turnitin and then I copied three sentences from your essay into mine and the teacher put it through Turnitin, whether it's our teacher in the same classroom or a teacher on the other side of the world, yeah. it would find the lines of your text in mine and it would say this text, these three sentences were already produced and they're already in our system. So somebody, presumably right. the second person to upload that work, has copied that. Awesome. And you know that, that technology has been around for a good number of years now and mm. they're updating it frequently and trying to keep track. ChatGPT is different. Yeah. ChatGPT generates unique text and what it does is if you're using it regularly, because it's using the, the style of writing that I use to produce something similar for me, mm. it's much harder for something like Turnitin to detect it because it's not copying it from anywhere. Yeah. It's creating new. Well, I think uh, all these bots, including ChatGPT, is doing is just crawls through the web, not necessarily one website, but maybe hundreds of websites and it, just... It does, but what it's producing is unique. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 in the it's, style of narration or... Exactly. And it's in the style of my narration. Yeah. It uses other work that I've written yeah. and that I've produced to look at my style of writing yeah. and produce unique features um. that are common only to me. That's where it's challenged. That's right? the biggest challenge in if terms of Anthony is a poet and Chad G. can write this uh, essay in the way of Anthony writes, then yes. that's very hard to do. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, if there's enough, if there's enough of a body of work that I have produced on the internet that it can go and find, it will do yeah. that. Now, it's, it's much harder for a student because a student generally has not produced a massive body of work. Right. But you can upload your own, your own writing. <coughs> so if you've written a book, you can upload, even if you've just written a letter, you can upload that letter to your Chat GBT profile. Yeah. And it will analyze that text and it will use writing styles from that letter in what it produces when you say next time your your stimulus to chat GPT is write a letter to my mum yeah. wishing her a happy birthday it will use the same yeah. same style that you had in the letter that you wrote loaded which was maybe a letter to a friend it will use the same style, kind of style to create something that's unique to you and that that's the biggest challenge of chat GPT but again yeah. that's where the teacher working alongside the student knowing the style of writing the student of cap is capable of yeah um, is is an interesting challenge. We talked about IB. I did some research on IB, but for the general people out there, do you want to outline maybe very high level? What is IB? What are the pros and cons and how it is different than other boards? Yeah, so I'll start with a little bit about the history of the IB. Sure. Um, the IB, International Baccalaureate, started off as a curriculum that would help diplomats who were moving around the different cities where the United Nations had offices back in the 1960s, I think. And those families wanted to take their children with them before they went off to university. They didn't want to put them in boarding schools. So a number of schools in New York, Geneva, I think Ho Chi Minh City, Lausanne, they got together and developed a curriculum where the students would be able to move from school to school as and when their parents moved offices without having to change the language of education, without having to change the curriculum, and they could get a, a, an academic qualification that would get them into a university. Mm -hmm. And that grew then into a program for primary years, so PYP primary years program, yeah. and the middle years program came along for students in secondary from 11 to 16. 
And more recently, in the last five years, uh, a program called the Careers Related Program, which is slightly different to the diploma program, but is pre-university. And it's a program where students can go more in depth in a, a limited area of mm -hmm. learning rather than the IB diploma, where students learn potentially six different subject areas. Okay. They have to learn English, they have to learn maths, they have to learn science, they have to learn what we call individuals and societies, which is a bit like social science. Um, they have to learn another language. So there's two languages typically and then ideally they learn an arts-based subject as well to make it a very holistic program a whole holistic diploma um, and we refer to that in the in the business as a pure diploma okay but they can drop the arts subject so they can take another science they can take another language they can take another humanities based subject depending on what they're passionate about and my advice always to a family um, and particularly to the students is to choose subjects that they are passionate about because yeah. if you're passionate about it you can learn more and you enjoy the learning Where whether, I mean, even if you're a very, very strong mathematician, yeah. but you don't really enjoy it, yeah. you know, d don't don't push yourself too much in that direction if you've right. got other passions, because you will find your way to jobs and opportunities that will suit you, and you will enjoy life a lot more if you're doing things that you love. Um, so the, the IB as a program is an inquiry-based program. Mm -hmm. And what essentially that means is that as a teacher, I want the students working harder than me in the classroom. Mm. I want them finding things out for themselves, whether that's through research, through experiments, through designing things and making prototypes and seeing them fail. And it's very much my job to create an environment where a child can learn from their mistakes in a safe, caring environment where they're not gonna get upset, they're not gonna get disappointed and downhearted, but actually they're gonna go, ah, hmm. I, I see what I did wrong there, I know how to do it better next time. The self-learning. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. So inquiry-based learning is very much student-centered. It's about giving students opportunities to do things where they are going to make mistakes. They're not gonna get perfect answers all the time, but helping them to, to grow and to, to learn from those little errors that help them fulfill their potential. So one other topic is the homeschooling concept you might have heard. So it began in 1960s and 70s, but it was never popular until post pandemic. It became more popular than ever, especially in Western North America, a lot of tech companies are present. I extracted some of the stats. In 2019, the homeschoolers were around 2.3 million in US. And by 2022, it's 4.3 million students who have been homeschooled. So that's a significant growth in just two years for homeschoolers. I did a little more digging and what are the, some of the motivation behind the homeschooling? There are broadly categorized. One is the concern about the school environment. Two, uh, dissatisfaction with the academic instructions. And three, the safety concerns. And four is for the religious regions, they want to homeschool their kids. Even though the homeschool requires a lot of patience, work from parents, some of the parents are willing to do that. So so just want to understand from you what is your take on homeschool concept and how does the industrial schools can bridge some of these gaps homeschoolers are trying to you know uh, raise there is definitely a shift for some parents i would imagine that they are choosing to keep their children in a safe cozy environment where they don't necessarily want the kind of problems that are associated with social media bullying it's more of a challenge now for schools to manage behavior yeah. Because behavior is no longer just in the dimensions of the room or the building or the school premises. It goes beyond that because one child will have access to another child late at night in their home through a phone, a yeah. mobile phone or a device. Therefore, it's a lot harder for schools. And many parents do see it as the school's responsibility to manage the interactions between students, yeah. even if it goes on outside of school hours through devices. And, and I've experienced parents who've been very bitter and angry about those interactions, even though there's very little I can do because I'm not the one that's placed the device in the hands of the children. I'm not the one that's allowed them to have accounts on social yeah. media that they're not old enough to have. They also have access to a lot more resources than parents had 15, 20, 30 years ago. Online platforms, the, the, the tutoring services like Baiju's and so on, the, the opportunities to find resources through the internet to educate yeah. are infinite. And that's exciting for a parent who has the time and the ability to sit with a child and help them to learn what that parent wants them to learn. Wonderful. I mean, yeah. home learning is a great way to go. Yeah. But realistically, how many parents actually have that time to do it well how many parents understand it enough about education and the learning process right to do it well and my worry is that when many of these students reach the point where they're either applying for jobs or they're applying to universities will they all have what the universities are looking for either academically or in terms of skills if 
some of those families are taking a slightly different approach and saying that they want to develop a young adult who is you know able to exist in the world and sustain their own life or own livelihood in a very specific way without needing further qualifications without needing to work in a in an employee employee employer relationship mm. then that might work very well but my worry again is that for many of these children if that homeschooling goes from kindergarten right the way through to grade 12 how good are their social skills going to be mm. our parents are aware that actually the vast majority of learning happens child to child exactly it's not what a teacher is giving the child in terms of information knowledge and skills it's one child looking at another child observing their interactions their response to different stimulus and copying it mm. and if you isolate your child and they're not exposed to that for long periods of time then they are going to struggle in terms of their social context and their understanding of the place within the world yeah. so i think there's lots of positives about it take a year out you know take, take your child and go and sail around the world with them and give them opportunities and keep them up to speed with some studies but give them opportunities that are unique but don't think for one minute that that is a complete substitute for the interactions that they have in a classroom setting in a, a good school mm. because it's about getting the balance right but uh, at the same time when there is this safety concern as well on the you know you mentioned bullying how does some of these things can be organically controlled one of the things i would say about a good school is that they will have a very clear definition of what bullying is mm. and it's important that parents understand what bullying is and what it is not children will naturally interact with other children yeah and the majority of time it's happy it's laughter it's fun it's learning sometimes students will say things to other students that are hurtful and mean and it's part of the learning process as to how to respond to that yeah now if that's happening repeatedly directed from one child to another child over a period of time it becomes bullying i've dealt with a lot of parents who at the first time one child touches another child or says something bad they come to me and say why are you not dealing with this bullying well actually that's not bullying that's yeah. one off it's learning yeah that child has been reprimanded the parents of the child that took action against another child that was upsetting they've been informed about it and they've been told very clearly if the child repeats it it's going to become bullying but children have to learn you know exactly. you can't you can't chastise a child yeah. and and deal with it at the highest level at the first opportunity and we've also got to remember that you know in a, a diverse learning environment in a classroom of 20 24 30 students that's a diverse learning environment because all of those students will come from different backgrounds they will have had different experiences many of them will have different ways of learning they may have behavioral and a neurodivergent ways of learning which could mean that they behave differently to other children but it's important that all children learn how to behave with all other children right because when they go out into the big wide world they're going to meet people that say things yeah. that are hurtful they're going and people may not mean it yeah Sadly there are people that will say things hurtfully deliberately but often people are just careless in what they say because of the environment they've been brought up in because something that's acceptable in my home may not be acceptable in your home and that's not their fault so it's helping children understand what and what is not appropriate mm. and what's acceptable so i do understand from a parent perspective they want to protect their child yeah but there's also an element of um you know what doesn't kill you makes you stronger you've got to be in situations that are challenging to exactly. develop resilience you won't develop resilience if you're wrapped in cotton wool and kept in a home environment with only your friend your your close family friends and your your, yeah. your grandparents and your cousins around you. yeah not that we are encouraging bullying but your child going to go out in the society oh, how to deal and, with these kind of situations and, and absolutely and, and you know we will have a zero tolerance yeah. to bullying as every school that I've worked in has yeah and when we have instances that are bullying we we will deal with it and we will work with the child to learn not to do it and if they continue and they're not learning then the parents will have to take that as a consequence that they will be asked to leave absolutely and, and, but it, it requires the other families to have patience and understanding and you know i'm not at liberty to show with some parents that a particular child is neurodivergent di yeah a child may have adhd they may have a behavioral disorder yeah. Yeah. they may have abuse at home that leads to them behaving badly in class because they can't control their behavior they're still learning to regulate their emotions i'm not at liberty to share that kind of information with all parents right parents have to have some trust in the school and i think that's 
one of the big problems now is that parents are finding it harder to trust because they themselves are of an age where they've come through in in a period of time where they're exposed to a lot more information and a lot of information is misleading and it's it's not necessarily the best thing to have little bits of information that are not well explained or not well understood yeah. can put parents in a position where they think they know what's best for their child right. and maybe it is but also maybe in the long term they may regret some of the decisions they take in, in making those those big steps to take a child out of school for the parents who will be in this kind of mindset not just for bullying even the roles and responsibilities we have joined our, our kid in a pretty good school and you know let them take care of it everything what do you say for those kind of parents those parents will have signed a contract with the school <laughs> that explains that this is a partnership yeah you know you don't just hand over your your child to a school even if it's a boarding school and expect the school to develop all the values and everything within that child the school can go a long way yeah to to establishing good habits to establishing a good set of values when a child leaves the school gates and goes back to their parents back to their grandparents to their family they will be exposed for a lot longer yeah to a lot more people that in all honesty they will have a lot closer relationships with that's the biggest challenge in the world of education is that we take a child in a case of a day student we have them for 15% of their lives before the age of 18 it's not a lot of time to make the kind of differences that parents expect us to make we'll work with the parents we'll we'll be offering workshops orientation programs to help parents understand what kind of things they can do to create the right kind of environment the right kind of values without compromising their fa- family values Yeah. but can give students the opportunities to develop resilience can develop empathy we'll we'll offer families that kind of support and guidance because for many families it's the first time they've had little ones many of our generation have grown up with home help with nannies with mm. home care yeah. that wasn't our parents yeah. we're now seeing a generation of parents who don't know what to do with their children because yeah. they didn't do it them, <laughs> they they weren't exposed to it from exactly. their own parents exactly they don't want the same kind of experience they had in yeah. its entirety they want elements of it and trying to help parents understand that they're not there to be their child's best friend. Yeah. They're there to make sure that when their child turns 18, 20, 21, they've got an independent, pleasant young adult with good values, good morals who can go out into the world that they can be proud of. And you don't necessarily get that by being the best friend by protecting them from everything. Exactly. By giving them everything they want when they want it. it. You've got to be the parent. That is such an important thing that we have to remind parents of more and more actually. It takes a village to grow a child to know Absolutely. Adult, you know? It really does. Um and that village so, is made up of many people. Yeah, the society, the, parents, teachers, you know, everyone. But the parents are the, the big ones. Big They one, are the role models. Yeah. And one of my my first response is to many parents who say that they're worried about their child being addicted to their device i often turn it back to them and say what do you role model for your child yeah do how, you sit at the dinner table how much screen time you are using yes, in first yeah. place yeah. if you put your phone down and tell your child come on we're yeah. going to sit now and we're going to read a book together yeah then your child will love reading it's it's about getting that role modeling right and that's what i'll expect from my teachers to role model really well for our students but parents also need to learn that as well perfect i really appreciate a lot of insights you know i really I enjoyed it. Um, you, know. you did quite literally ask me anything and uh, <laughs> i'm sure we'll talk again and yeah. look forward to welcoming you onto the campus very soon sure